This week, we welcome comedian, musician, and impressionist Ami Kozak. And of course, in war, there are innocent civilians to deny, on both sides. There's innocent civilians, but the question is accountability. There were every single person that has perished and been killed in this war was alive on October 4th, 5th, and 6th. Something happened on October 7th, and don't confuse. People throw around words like murder and genocide and all this nonsense without understanding that there's a very big difference between aggression and retaliation. There's a very big difference between murder and self-defense. And one has to be very morally clear when they're sympathizing that Hamas is oppressing these people. Hamas doesn't stand for the values that you're talking about when you talk about a free Palestine. What are you arguing for here? You're talking yeah. about the elimination of Israel and a free Palestine from a liberal human, from a leftist human rights perspective. You think you would have protections for LGBTQ, minority rights, free expression, all the liberal values you claim to hold dear in a free Palestine under Hamas rule? Are you out of your mind? This is Walkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetisey. I'm Bridget Fetisey, and you are welcome. <laughs> you know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. If you like our work and want to support us, the best way to do that is join Fetacy.com. You'll get access to behind the scenes content, outtakes, discounts on merch, and the ability to submit questions for some of our upcoming guests. Support your favorite scrappy little internet heroes at Fetacy.com. Watkins Welcome is brought to you by Patriot Gold. Call 888-614-9238 for a free investor guide today. I'm with Ami Kozak, everybody. Welcome to Watkins Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be with you. You're a very busy man these days, flying all over. <sighs> a little bit. Yeah, you know what? Thank God. It's, it's, uh, there's, there's stress that's good and stress that's bad. Stress nonetheless, but I'll take the good stress. You know? What what have you been going all over the place doing? Well, um, I, I'm i based on the East Coast, but I lived on the West Coast for about 10 years, so I have a lot of work here. And then um, what was interesting was, you know, I come from the world of entertainment, doing music and comedy. <clears throat> but, you know, over the last month, as the world has gone fully upside down and we've had full reality and morality collapse, you know, I took to my platforms to uh, to address what was going on in in Israel and in my community as a as a as a modern Orthodox Jew and in my and, and like sort of being outspoken about it. But what what that ended up doing was not being sort of veering away from my audience, but almost I can't even explain it. It brought this whole other you know uh, world into it in, in in a very positive way, I'd say because. Yeah, it just, I think everything is sort of like this great before and after that's taken place. Yeah. Sort of like, it reminds me of when COVID happened, everybody was like, uh, there's a before COVID and after COVID period. So it yeah. feels like, at least from where I am, there's a before October 7th and an after October 7th. And until we can straighten out the new reality we're in, everything is sort of, you know, uh, tunnel vision focused on on uh, trying to uh, bring some sense and clarity into a morally depraved world. <laughs> Not to be dramatic, but Not it's hard to be hyperbolic right now. It feels very uh, necessary to be outspoken and make sure everyone's on the same page or find out where people are, you know, standing. On I issues. feel like we've found out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like there's a, a lot has been revealed in the past month too. It's, it is weird. Like, you know, one of the things I've been saying I think you and I, before we started recording, we were talking about how we were remembering like the early fractures in the culture mm -hmm. and the IDW. And I, I, I've been saying for years, kind of reality remains undefeated. And you can like hypothesize about a lot of these things and go down this postmodern, like empty void of a belief system. But eventually you have to grapple with reality. And I think that this is another one of those moments where reality is being test, you know, people are being confronted with reality. Yeah. And you're, you're seeing the sort of frightening consequences of bad ideas mm. in the culture, specifically on like the far woke left, I would say of the idea of 
looking at things in the, you know, sort of um, oppressor and oppressed lens and viewing things that way. And that we're all just uh, exist in a world of, of uh, group identities being paramount. And one group that has the power is always evil. And one group that doesn't is always virtuous. So those ideas, you know, for a long time, you know, it's just Jordan Peterson out there sounding the alarm bells and a lot of people <laughs> saying, Oh, stop. And he's like, no, you know, I studied the crimes of the 20th century and I know it cold. I know it backwards. Okay. And he's, and everyone thinking he's being hysterical and hyperbolic. And then all of a sudden now you're seeing some of the worst atrocities <laughs> since the 20th century committed against Jews. And what do you find? You find that not in the street, not just in the streets, or actually in the barbarians that perpetuated these atrocities, people celebrating them, but in the ivory towers and in the elite institutions, you are seeing the indoctrinated youth of the of the far woke left basically celebrating it and justifying it. And suddenly, like you said, everything has become illuminated, where you realize, wow, it is not just monsters and barbarians that can do the worst crimes against humanity and and get away with it. It's the people who celebrate it and justify it in the elite intellectual circles in our culture, in the West. That's how this stuff happens. And when that moment happened for me, I was like, I'm a grandchild of Holocaust survivors. I always kind of wondered how this happened. Yeah. How did they just, how did the world stand by and let it happen? How did people make excuses for it? Yeah. I don't have those questions anymore. Yeah. It answered all of those questions. You are seeing modern day Nazi youth saying resistance by any means necessary because we're not looking at Israelis or Jews as human beings. They are colonizers. They are oppressors. Right. Um, they are settlers. And we can, in the name of revolution, commit the most horrible crimes against humanity and celebrate them as virtuous. Yeah, it's it's been that was something that happened. I've always been I have a friend who was in the Holocaust and interviewed him for this podcast actually and just read I've read so many books and there are just so many images that stood out, but one that stuck with me forever was from I think it was a young woman and she remembers being on the train as a little girl going by and people were just going about their day. You know, like mm -hmm. I'm and I'm like, how? And now I know how I I yeah. just I, mean, I was like, how yeah. did how was no one like, hey, that seems wrong. <laughs> I think in order for this stuff to really happen uh, on a and <clears throat> for for us to be, you know, complicit in it and for, for this stuff to happen and, and the world to stand idly by, you have to convince people not that, well, we're all evil and we're OK with it, but that the evil actions they're doing are actually virtuous or actually good. And that, mm. you know, people can feel a sense of moral virtue and superiority by, by uh, dehumanizing the group. It takes this whole propagandistic effort to dehumanize, uh, de de delegitimize Israel, dehumanize Jewish people. And it's like, you know, you can look back and I'm not like so versed on all the literature about it, but you know, the idea of Jews were vermin. We need to purify. We need to, we know the left co-ops, the language, in, a, in other words, to make it seem like all of this stuff is patible. Jordan Peterson had this line that I never really understood until recently, which was, all the early Nazi propaganda was rooted in compassion. Mm. You know, and you're like, what a frightening line. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about these kind of things, it's like what, what they were doing in order to justify atrocity was to elevate society, purify society. And then you see that in the 30s and 40s, and then you see, let's make the world clean and there's a picture of uh, an Israeli flag and a Jewish star in a garbage can at these protests in the UK or wherever, or Norway, I think that was, but you're seeing that imagery and that's the ominous parallels is all I can say. So it just feels like the dark shadow of history is now upon us. And if, you know, you woke I, up on October 8th after October 7th, not knowing where you stand, then your moral compass is broken. And I don't know what to do about that other than just speak, like you said, tell the truth to the best way I can. And yeah, uh, find like-minded people out there. It's weird to see, like, I was joking the other day that Hitler really missed out not having women in Hitler Youth because you see all, it's like all women tearing down these posters. I was like, I feel like he oh. really underestimated women in this. I know they were getting them ready to be breeders, but they still <laughs> could have served a pretty powerful function. Yeah, pretty, pretty it's, feisty. It's all women, but unhinged. There was one oh, the God. other day and I was, my cousin and I were talking, we were on our way somewhere and she was like, you know, what is that? I was like, I think it's just like, 
the brain, for all this talk about postmodernism, I really do think it is such an empty, nihilistic, meaningless, nothing, like nothing is real, everything is objective, and then you end up tearing down posters of children who have been kidnapped and Mm -hmm. thinking that you're somehow the good, you're, you're telling yourself like, I'm the good person. Yeah. Well, when, when, when you, to get psycho psychoanalytical about it a little bit, like I think between all the moral relativism and sort of everything being devoid of meaning for a lot of these young people, I think you, there's still this thirst for wanting to be virtuous and meaningful and be on the right side of something, be part of a cause. And I think you're seeing that this sort of, sort of, I don't know, people who feel resentful and bitter, they feel like there's a void there, there's meaningless, and they desperately are, I'm being gracious when I say that about these people, because I don't think it comes from informed ideology. A lot of these Mm. people in the streets screaming, you know, into what, there is only one solution, intifada revolution, and they're ripping (laughs) down posters. They they couldn't, as Douglas Murray's like, they couldn't find the river Jordan on a map. You know, they, they, (laughs) they don't know what they're talking about. They have no connection to the region necessarily or know anyone personally affected, but they are getting on board to feel part of some virtuous something. cause. Mm-hmm. Something, which I think beneath the surface speaks to maybe maybe it's upper middle class boredom in these universities mm. and people who feel like their life has been sort of absence of real meaning and they they but but you can see how the bad ideas have been manifested that to tell them that um this is just Israeli propaganda, like what you can get people to do without even realizing it, without a sort of sense of self-reflection. You're ripping down posters of babies who've been kidnapped and thinking that you're morally, that you have the moral high ground in doing that. And then sitting down there, saw an image of a video of someone who did that and then sat down and ate a bagel, the chutzpah. <laughs> did you see the clip of the person who was like, it was like, can you leave us alone, please? She was like holding posters. She had just ripped down Jews who were kidnapped and had the gall. To eat a bagel. Talk oh, about wow. cultural appropriation. She was yeah, like, that's... can you please leave us alone? Can you... These no. are colonizers. Anyway, so to <laughs> eat a bagel, I thought that was wrong. That was really wrong. At least eat a strudel or something. Something, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, the, the point is like, it, you know, there's different layers of this. And I think as a Jewish community and, you know, there's sort of like a self-defense mode where you don't really have time to convince a bunch of mindless idiots who don't know anything about this to like bring them up to speed. Seems like a lost cause, but I think at some point, looking back on it, maybe I'm hopeful that this generation who did this will look back and say, like, this came from a much deeper, darker place of feeling, um, you know, this need to fill their life with something, and there's nihilism and self hatred and resentment. Because the same people who are hating on ripping on posters and Jews, they hate everything, you know. They yeah, hate America. Weird. They hate the West. They hate everything. Right. It feels they hate everything more- good. You know, yeah. masochistic. It feels like a self hatred, and it, that's it, where a lot of hate for others stems from. They hate themselves, and therefore they need to put that hate, as opposed to blaming themselves for the problems in their life. It's much easier to blame other people, and Jews are the historical perpetual scapegoat for all of life's problems. So, yeah, you know. we got sad, and I had a great conversation, and I was like, "Why is the West so self loathing?" You know, it's mm-hmm. it's such a very strange, self destructive. I mean, I I get it on a personal level. I have a lot of self-loathing. I've dealt with addiction. So I can understand, but I've never, there just seems like an overall lack of historical perspective about what it means to be a human Mm -hmm. that I don't, I'm like, we have it so good. You know, never Mm -hmm. in the history of the world have, has anyone had it better than these Ivy League kids who are, and it seems just like a, a general lack of gratitude. I, I swear it's like these. this generation is like the trust fund babies of freedom. They mm-hmm. just don't, they don't quite yeah. understand what they have. I, I wonder, I mean, just this thinking out loud about it, you know, there's this amazing phrase. It's, I think it, Thomas Sowell is either it's his phrase or, you know, the economist Thomas Sowell, like it's mm-hmm. either his expression or he's quoting somebody, but he said when it, when it comes to making a choice between blaming yourself for problems or blaming others, people seldom blame themselves. Yeah. So back to the point about finding a scapegoat, I think when you've come from a comfortable life of 
privilege or having things that you take for granted and not knowing anything from that, and you still lack fulfillment and you still are looking for meaning and maybe you've Belonging. been disappointed or community or any of those yeah. things. There's really two, two types of people that that generates people who take accountability and look inward and say, okay, what can I do to make my life better? Or I'm going, and I can be grateful for what I do have and I can be empathetic and grateful and humble and, and accountable. That's one approach. And the other approach broadly is I'm going to be resentful. I'm going to blame the world. I'm going to blame the West. I'm going to blame these things. And, you know, maybe that's, that's going to be where I channel my uh, energy because it's some grand external reason why my life is still, you know, shitty. I don't know. Like, that's something I'm thinking about. Like, where could this come from and stem from at a deeper level? Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, like, you're dividing people up into sort of people who are accountable, grateful, humble versus people who are bitter and resentful. Um, and as I know a lot of Jordan Peterson based on just all my shtick. So you, you, he, he talks about that a lot. Like, you know, these people, even the people who are, you know, anti-industry, the climate, the people who are talking about environmentalism to such a degree where they want to just, just demonize all industry. It's like, there's a, there's a, there's this bitterness and resentment for humanity, mm -hmm. you know, itself mm -hmm. for being itself, which is, it's a deep, dark thought, but it's something that I, I, I kind of wonder about like where it all stems from. Yeah. You know? I, I was joking, like the climate change activists or this was years ago on our show Dumpster Fire that we were mm -hmm. just a couple of decades. We were just a couple of news cycles away from if you care about the environment, kill yourself. But we're <laughs> we're kind of already there. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you read, a, if you read like, guys like Alex Epstein and people about the, the, on the climate subject a, a little bit about this, the anti-human sentiment mm. that permeates all of all of these ideas, the uh, say generally far woke ideas about far left woke ideas generally it's like there's a real anti-human sentiment that permeates all that overpopulation we are a stain on the planet we're disgusting this to the extent that the west is prosperous and has higher standards of living it somehow becomes more demonized to the extent that societies raise themselves up out of poverty and more mm -hmm. people are doing well that's just gross. You're using more resources. You're having more children's more children, you know, shame on you, shame on you, humanity. There's a real resentment at the very core to existing. It's yeah. Really it's very, it's very <laughs> weird. If you're looking for another podcast with lots of random guests, interesting people who you never really know who you're going to hear from, might I suggest the Jordan Harbinger show. Each episode is a conversation with a different fascinating guest. And when I say there's something for everyone here, I really mean that. In one episode, Jordan talks to a hostage negotiator from the FBI who offers techniques on how to get people to like and trust you, which sounds useful and disturbing at the same time. He's also sat down with just so many luminaries of our time, Malcolm Gladwell, Kobe Bryant, Ray Dalio, Mark Cuban, Matthew McConaughey, Dennis Rodman, so many interesting people you've never heard of and so many big names. We really enjoy this show and we think you will as well. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Walk-Ins Welcome is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening to me, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. 
I <laughs> I was thinking too about this. The other thing that's really been revealed in this moment is just how <laughs> true the horseshoe theory is, <laughs> because mm-hmm. there's a lot of interesting stuff. You know, the far right's always we've there's been anti-Semitism there for a long time, but there seems to be a like populist fracture occurring on the right wing. I think you were on Candace Owens podcast and we're discussing a lot of this with her and she's, there's a kind of an open fight happening between her and Ben even right now, Mm -hmm. as we speak, what do you kind of make of what's going on in the right wing? You know, so it's interesting. Um, In the days following October 7th, I think the common sense liberals in our world woke up to what we've been shouting about, Forever. which is this <laughs> far left anti-Semitism that is there. Right. The mask of anti-Zionism, you know, thinly coating, vile, blatant, unapologetic anti-Semitism. Mm-hmm. We can talk about, you know, the mass protests in the streets from the river to the sea. Quote now, now these people are there's pro Hamas rallies. It's not the call for a free, prosperous Palestinian state, it's the call for the elimination of a Jewish state. Mm -hmm. From the streets of the UK and Paris in the West, all the way to the ivory towers of universities in Colombia, where you have professors praising the attacks of October 7th as glorious events and the spineless administrations refusing to condemn it Mm -hmm. um, because we don't want to, because all of a sudden now they're all pro free speech (laughs) and all of a sudden they won't take political stance as if this is a political stamp to condemn mass murder and rape. Um, Microaggression's bad, actual aggression. Want to say anything? Um, yeah. <laughs> so we all woke up. I mean, everybody woke up to that. It was all very illuminated. And I think the benefit, the silver lining there was it's very hard to fight this stuff when it's obfuscated. Once upon a time, people would kind of mask a lot of these ideas behind no, you know, unclear, vague clouds of, you know, what they were like believing and they weren't out front and center about it. So it's gross, but at least we can see it. These people are anti Semitic, pro Hamas, pro the destruction of Israel and Jews worldwide. Fine. So that happened. And a lot of articles were written from people who were left of center saying, you know, I've had to reevaluate and look at these and look at this stuff. But then I started to notice, okay, the horseshoe. There's also this kind of, you know, far right anti-Semitism that we kind of know is there. I wasn't always as worried about it because it was not ascendant in the culture. No. You know? Disney Plus is not making shows about white supremacists. You know, it wasn't, you don't see it in, in, in institutionalized to the effect uh, no. on that. You don't see the worst of the far right ideas and identitarian right in academia, in media, Everywhere. Yeah. In, in, uh, in corporate America. You don't see it celebrated there. But you do start to see this weird alliance that basically centers all around classic anti-Semitism. The Jewish scapegoat, this idea that when it comes to the far left and those ideas, Jews fit this caricature of being white settler colonial dressing minorities and marginalized groups and we are the socialists and they are the capitalists okay and then you go to the far right and jews become this cabal glo- the globalists the globalists <laughs> they become this secret cabal that's controlling everything and israel is actually controlling our government and putting its priorities first in order right. to dictate the whims of america jews are this all powerful all controlling behind the scenes player and uh, they are compromising america and they're they're trying to put our uh, you know they're making America come second to doing Israel's bidding. No one's critically thinking about the fact that there's a strategic alliance between Western countries that have common enemies. It's like right. But that all that argument aside, when it comes from a hateful, suspicious place, the Jew as the scapegoat in any of these scenarios, and to those people, the Jews are the socialists. They're the communists. So it's all fully incoherent ideologically. The only thing that it has in common is. Jew hatred. (laughs) It's not the Jew that's the shapeshifter, according to them. It's anti-Semitism that is a shapeshifter. And it comes from, you know, theological anti-Semitism. You know, there's different strands of that. The the anti-Semitism in the Muslim world that we're seeing, and now this far right and far left, they all agree on one thing. Hey, it's a great moment of bipartisanship. What can I say? Everyone hates the Jew. And it's really sick, and it's really troubling to see that now uh, on the ascent, and also... Oddly enough, I think Kanye, the Overton window, the the, yes. the the remarks that he made, one can talk about where that came from for him. And he was obviously, to me, very mentally unstable and on a spiraling meltdown saying that stuff. 
But more troubling than even his remarks alone was the reaction to his remarks and how many people were like, Kanye speaking truth, Kanye's yes. onto something and creates this culture where it's fully acceptable to be suspicious of Jewish success or influence. And suddenly you can call these things into question and it becomes more palatable and just open for discussion. Now, anti-Semitism seems to just be back on the table to consider maybe the Jews are up to something in this weird conspiratorial way. And that's where it lives on the far right. Um, well, so, and it's kind of in a lot of populism, you know, I, yeah. I, I think that there are people rightfully who just don't want to get involved in Ukraine. They don't want to get involved in Israel. They feel mm -hmm. like we have problems here at home. I'm not exactly this. I don't know anything about geopolitics at all. I just do sent, tend to know that there, like you said, there are common enemies that we should be aware of. And I don't know that just like sitting around and waiting to be attacked is the best idea, but. Sure. That's a, yeah, I there's a legitimate. This, yeah. I yeah, saw no. this um, example of a horseshoe. I think it was on, it was a perfect example. I wish I had screenshot it, but it was, you know, Karen Atia, that Washington post. Um, I think she's at the Washington post journalist and she was, quote, tweeting Candace saying, like, I can't believe I agree with Candace and <laughs> and on all these things that she's saying. And I was like, this is fucking bananas. Like mm -hmm. these this woman during the Trump administration, these are all people who hated Candace. And now she represents something that the left agrees. It, it was I was like, it what is happening? Makes for strange bedfellows, uh, uh, you know. It's um, like the the meme though of the you know handshaking, like hates 100%. the Jews. Yeah, but you know what's interesting? You know, I I do think it's important, I you know, to make a distinction between ignorance, lack of awareness versus hate. And you know, I think you know I could talk more about the Candace uh, interview and conversation we had, but I took that conversation to be at least an effort to have a conversation in good faith about something where, you know, not maybe having a, a misguided or misunderstood view about the Jewish community and what we're doing or anti-Semitism in general, you know, having a blind spot to anti-Semitism is different than being anti-Semitic. Totally. Being hateful is being different than being ignorant. And it would behoove us as Jews and non-Jews alike in the world awash with great to make sure that when you're, you're, you're calling out anti-Semitism, it's not just this umbrella term for everybody who misunderstood everything. You have to, you have to make sure that we're drawing a distinction between people who have hateful intentions, hateful motivations, and are very clear about it versus people who may have questions versus people who are ignorant about history or insensitive to, you know, the Jewish experience throughout history, which became evident in, in, in my conversation with her, that there was a lot of a lack of awareness of the, you know, decades and uh, centuries and millennia long persecution of, of Jews throughout the world and what's been going on versus the last generation of Jews who've lived comfortably and have built themselves up. It was very ironic because, you know, Candace has always spoken about shedding the victim mentality and, and all of that. And if there's any group that has done that pretty effectively that I've witnessed over a generation, it's, you know, come, it's, it's the Jewish community that we take pride in the fact that you know, even the state of Israel existing is a big statement of shedding a victim mentality that we're mm -hmm. going to defend ourselves. So it all came, it, 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 you know, th I think she was just connecting dots in, in the wrong way and drawing strange connections that were misguided. So, you know, it's a challenging thing because at a time when you're, when it seems so obvious why you would stand with Israel and stand on the side of Israel after the days of October 7th, how could you not? You know, it's important to try to make sure to keep your head straight and and look to who's not understanding the issue, who's removed from the issue. Part of the reason I felt compelled to make videos was not to reach the most hateful people out there who just hate Jews or have conspiracy theories about Jews. Probably not redeemable at this point uh, to reach them. But there's a whole middle of people who either, you know, are not informed or connected to the issue. And so to hear moral clarity, you know, helps. And to hear information and context and all that stuff helps. And I think for people who, who want to defend Israel, but don't really know how from a courage of their conviction standpoint. It was important for me to kind of voice that and put that out there. But these dialogue and these conversations for me, you know, Candace, I give her credit. She, I, I, I tweeted at her uh, something pretty firm, but she messaged me. She had me on. We had an hour long conversation, listened to each other, ended 
and it was cordial and constructive, you know? So if there's a needle to be moved, I, I'm hoping that it, it moved in some way into a constructive direction, you know? Mm. Yeah, it was, it was um, I feel like a lot of people just kind of line up where their party is, you know, like mm -hmm. if they're libertarian, they're lining up with the libertarians. If they're populist conservatives, they're lining up with Tucker and Candace. If they're, mm -hmm. everyone just kind of lines sure. up where they, and that's one of the things I've seen, you know, Glenn Greenwald pushing back against is not, and mm -hmm. I think he's doing a pretty good job of it for the most part, mm -hmm. as how not everyone who's, you know, pro-Palestine is anti-Semitic. I think a lot of people mm -hmm. who are rightfully concerned about the humans in Gaza and the West Bank are not hateful of Jews. Right, right. Um, yes, I mean, Glenn Greenwald's interesting because there is a good point to be made that, like you said, when politics becomes so tribal, when you're persuaded by a certain set of ideas or an ideology, what happens is you then say, okay, this is sort of my team and every issue that comes your way, as opposed to asking yourself, what do I think about this issue? You ask yourself, what am I supposed to think about this issue? Right. And that's the big problem. You're like, okay, so if I'm a conservative, I have to filter every information and every situation that comes my way as a conservative and make sure that when I dialogue with people, when I engage with people, I have to make sure I'm representing for a tribe so that I give the mm. right conservative response. And that speaks to the problem of audience capture and the commentary class that we're looking at on, uh, you know, and I think that diminishes and dilutes honest conversation between people. Because mm -hmm. the truth is, if you're debating somebody, it really should be win-win. If, if you get the better of somebody in an argument, then maybe they've kind of learned something. And if they get the better of you, then it gives you something to think about. But in good faith, conversations in good faith are trying to arrive at a better version of the truth, a better, more refined understanding of whatever the truth is. And if you come at it like that, then there's no like, it's, you know, there's obviously debate out there that's team sports and and like, it feels fun to watch, you know, love what, you know, thug life compilations of Ben Shapiro, Duncan on the libs. I mean, that's all satisfying and it helps reinforce certain sets of ideas, but you're really doing that for your team, for your, for the echo, when the echo chambers behind you are like, nice, it's all fun. But in a time where the stakes are so high, when we really need to like differentiate between cruelty and humanity, between good and evil, um, it's better, you know, I'm not knocking that per se, but just to be mindful of the fact that try to think about these issues independently and critically. And I think, you know, like to what you said about Glenn, Glenn Greenwald and people like that. Yeah. To his credit, he does not try to have tribal allegiances. And we saw his takes, you know, he's gone against the sort of leftist establishment when, when that was appropriate to do in terms of vaccines and lockdowns. I haven't, I, and lockdowns, I didn't follow everything, but I could, I knew that he was outspoken against that. And there's guys out there, Russell Brand, who at one point I was like, Oh my God, he's just, He's way out there, but then on certain things, I'm like, oh, interesting. So there's more common ground out there when you're critically thinking about issues independently. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I can't really understand right now is wherever your sort of personal allegiances or, or, or sympathies lie in this conflict in Israel, why isn't everybody calling for the immediate surrender of the hostages, <laughs> uh, immediate uh, release of the hostages and surrender of Hamas? Yeah, why isn't everybody who cares it. about... Why doesn't anybody who has sympathy for the Palestinian people out there? And of course, in war, there are innocent civilians to deny, on both sides. There's innocent civilians. But the question is accountability. There were Every single person that has perished and been killed in this war was alive on October 4th, 5th, and 6th. Something happened on October 7th. And don't confuse people throw around words like murder and genocide and all this nonsense without understanding that there's a very big difference between aggression and retaliation. There's a very big difference between murder and self-defense. And one has to be very morally clear when they're sympathizing that Hamas is oppressing these people. Hamas doesn't stand for the values that you're talking about when you talk about a free Palestine. What are you arguing for here? You're talking yeah. about the elimination of Israel and a free Palestine from a liberal human, from a leftist human rights perspective. You think you would have protections for LGBTQ, minority rights, free expression, all the liberal values you claim to hold dear in a free Palestine under Hamas rule, are you out of your mind? They so are. I can't under <laughs> I just can't understand that. I can understand yeah. sympathy. I can understand people who uh obviously it's painful to look at the optics of war, but war sometimes yeah. is about the choices between bad and worse. And 
Hamas's aggression and the brutal uh, attack on Israel, deliberately targeting and maximizing civilian death, burning people alive in their homes deliberately, mm -hmm. filming it with glee, mm -hmm. taking parents, tying them behind their back and burning children in front of their parents, killing children, uh, putting parents in front of their children deliberately and celebrating it, calling back their parents saying, mom, dad, I killed Jews. I killed Jews to not understand the moral difference there. Yeah. Between Mostad and what the IDF does in response to the aggression. Um, if you don't have a, if, if you draw moral equivalency there, then your moral compass is broken. It doesn't mean you can't be unfeeling for the innocent uh, Palestinians who have suffered in this or the Israelis who suffered in this. But remember if you care about Palestinian rights, you should be pro-Israel. You know, you should support what they're, you know, their uh, efforts to eliminate and eradicate and disarm Hamas. You should support that. And, and to, for, for that not to be fully understood and everyone fully on board with that, so troubling. Yeah, it's so yeah. sad when you hear about, like, I just can't imagine what the people were thinking because so many of the people were like peace, you know, activists mm. and wanted to, they brought people from Gaza to go to the hospitals in Israel oh, and they volunteered the victims, and they probably, yeah. they, yeah, so many of the victims in Israel and in they Israel. probably had so many, much more even contact with Palestinians mm. than they anyone had one else. Flaw, they were Jews. Yeah. And mm. even non Jews. It was, it, it, it's Arabs. There was Arabs yeah. at, at the Nova Music Festival. I think one of their, I, I saw some story of, of uh, an Arab man who was like uh, the either bus a bus driver, driver there mm -hmm. and he was accused of being a collaborator and they killed him. When yeah. Hamas took over in Gaza in 2006, they murdered all of their political opponents. Other Muslims, yeah. uh, they, they murdered everyone there um, and took there's over. This, they killed people trying to escape Northern Gaza. Yeah. So if you're pro innocent Palestinian suffering, Channel your outrage, channel your anger at those accountable, which just seems so clear as day to me. And I, I can't understand that. There's um, this one woman I follow on Twitter and she's been debunking like so much of the misinformation that goes around and she's Syrian and she's so mad because so many people are appropriating all of the images from Syria, which no one really gave a shit about. And, you know, she's like, there have been so many genocides of Muslims all over the world, like actual trying to purge these populations, the Uyghurs, the Rohingya. The, I mean, you could go on and on. And where where's the outrage? Where is it? Yeah. Well, there's no <laughs> Jews. There's no Jews in those scenarios. And there's or no West. Israel in those scenarios. There's so no, no one. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's quite selective, isn't it? Talk about ethnic cleansing. You know how many, all the Jews that were expelled from surrounding Arab and Muslim countries over the years that uh, emigrated to Israel? Like, where are those Jewish populations in Yemen, um, in, uh, in in all of these different countries around that have uh, shrunken in Egypt? Where are the Jews? You know, where are all those Jews? And are we arguing for a free Palestine that has to be Jew free? That's an interesting uh, principle. That's an interesting uh, perspective to get behind. How many yeah. Jews live in Gaza? None. <laughs> <laughs> they left in 2005 for 20 years. We had an experiment of what it could be like to have a free, prosperous Palestinian state. As I've heard people say, it could have been Singapore. And, you know, it's like everyone starts the story in the middle. They see security apparatus. They see checkpoints and fences. They're like, that's wrong. How could that be? I'm like, well, what? You ever ask you why that needs to happen? Why there needs to be security? You know, oh, so they abandoned just... Israel so that the IDF could do what they wanted. That haven't you heard? <laughs> <laughs> that's they'll why they... find, they'll find any which way. So it's like, it doesn't matter if the Jews in Israel were peaceniks. It doesn't matter. It, that's what's sick about it, because the flaunt the to 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 defend this on virtuous grounds to say that Israel does these things uh, has a, uh, a a culture that embraces individual rights and protections for minorities and all of these things. To the extent that you do that, in a way that only reinforces the resentment towards it. Back to what we were saying yeah. at the very beginning of our conversation, this resentment to those principles in the West, this idea that a culture can be superior, you know, not based on immutable, immutable characteristics, not based on race, not based on all those nonsensical ideas, but based on culture and values. There are, and this idea of a world where there's moral subjectivism and, you know, uh, moral relativism, no values can be better than other values. 
That's mm. the lens by which a lot of these ideas are coming from. We cannot judge other cultures, cultures that oppress women, oppress minorities, that, uh, that are murderous. No, we can't judge. There is no morality. It is all subjective. And for us to judge is just our supremacy. Our, it's just <laughs> our, you know, Western supremacy, hegemony, blah, 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 blah. I mean, that's, <laughs> at, the, that's at the foundation intellectually of a lot of this, you know? And I think, like, as we were saying very early on to come full circle about it, these ideas are dangerous. They're not just ideas in the abstract in the ivory towers. They manifest and indoctrinate and then are acted out in the streets of people ripping down posters of children. Our national debt is a real world problem. Our government spends more on interest payments than it does funding the Pentagon. We've gone from $6 trillion in debt to $34 trillion in 20 years. And there's a direct correlation to the national debt and the price of gold. In 2010, our debt, 13 trillion, gold, 1,000 an ounce. 2023, 33 trillion, and gold is $2,000 an ounce. Speaker of the House Mike Johnson warned our greatest threat to national security isn't Russia or China, it's our national debt. Call the proud Americans of the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late. Mention Bridget Phetasy, and you'll always get best-in-class service from Patriots protecting Patriots. Patriot Gold Group has a no-fee-for-life IRA where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold and silver, and you may be eligible for the no-fee-for-life IRA on qualifying rollovers. Call 888-614-9238 for a free investor guide today. Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs top-rated gold IRA dealer seven years in a row. Call 888-614-9238. Mention Bridget Phetasy. I'm Walter Masterson. And I'm Maximilian Clark. And we're basically journalists. No, no, we're not. Well, we do travel across America and interview people. Yeah, using God to solve murders, and it's, it's proven communication. Tell me, wait, tell me everything about that. But we also dress up like extremists and sneak into their protests. I care about children. That is why I pay my court-mandated child support. Well, that's undercover journalism. Okay, and that time we pretended to be Trump's legal team during the indictment? Trump loves America. He's, he considers us all family. That's why he's always asking us for money. Okay, so we are not journalists. We're TikTok comedians asking questions real journalists are too smart to ask. But we also talk to real experts and scientists and smart people and stuff. And make fun of them. Yeah, I guess that's why we named our show We Are Not Journalists. Because we're better. We have a podcast. A podcast that's available on whatever podcast app you use to get your podcasts. Podcast. Podcast. How did you get your, you know, where, what's your kind of background? How did you, what do you do when you're mm. not kind of on a tour of sadness and open-mindedness? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know, so I served in the Knesset for 10 years. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 my identity at its core is an entertainer. I'm a musician yes. and a comedian. I, um, I'm a modern Orthodox Jew, proud, raised in a modern Orthodox community, and I have family in Israel, uh, cousins, and, um, and I've visited many times. I lived there for a year after high school. Um, that's like sort of my personal story. I went to, uh, you know, Jewish schools growing up, and I'm from a, you know, Jewish Orthodox community. Um, so Israel was a very big part of our education and, and our identity and, uh, you know, to be proud and Zionistic. I love how people think like Zionist, Zionist chill is like some derogatory term. I'm like, yeah, I'm a Zionist. Like it's not, <laughs> it, it's this, this attempt to co-op the word Zionist, the idea that Jews have the right to a home in their ancestral homeland that they were indigenous to, you know, thousands of years ago. So that's an interesting place to all of a sudden go against the, you know, whatever, but I, I'm going <laughs> off. The point is, yes, Zion, I, you know, proud modern Orthodox Zionist Jew had that background from that community. Um, Professionally, you know, I played in bands growing up and began my career writing music for film and TV commercials. I play in a band called Distant Cousins. We do a lot of uh, original music, uh, making records. We were active in LA for about 10 years and um, I'm back on the East Coast now, but we're still in that space. So I spent time in like the entertainment industry making music and I dove into comedy in the past few years 
doing a lot of stuff online through social media. And I'd been performing on stage as a musician for many years and then started doing more stand up as I got into the New York comedy scene. Um, socially, I'd always done my shtick and impressions and all that stuff. But in the age of social media, it was a great way to have an outlet to build that audience. Yes. Um, and because I'm also int intellectually curious, you know, a lot of the people in my world were the IDW folks, uh, the Jordan Petersons. And uh, so I was doing impressions of those people just because they were sort of in my For You page, you know? So, ha, well, you know, started like doing that, you know? And uh, yeah. <laughs> you're so, so good at impress. It's such a gift. It's like Shane Gillis yeah. when he does Trump. You're yeah. like, you well, you know, Shane's very good. He's not the best. He's not the best. I do it. <laughs> Shane is good. He's very good. There's a, there's a lot of different Trump impressions. You know, there's teleprompter <laughs> Trump, which is a lot more sensual. <laughs> teleprompter Trump is everyone does like bombastic Trump. He's my Trump. favorite. Te teleprompter yeah. Trump is always my favorite. Teleprompter like, Trump is more sensual. Trump. He's more sensual. He slows it down like he's trying to seduce you. And he's like, we're gonna do. Amazing things for America. <laughs> the radical left has captured our major institutions. We're not going to let that happen to America. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you, know, you can tell he's really trying to like dial it back from his like rally Trump. Yeah, yeah. So he's like, the radical left has kept. I told them they're not going to be able to get away with this. We're not going to let that happen. Smoochy, smoochy. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I started doing a lot of stuff online. Can you do a Ben Shapiro? That's so, you know, everyone asks, like, when you get an impression that you can't do, is it, for, well, I could do a few words, but there's, like, integrated impressions that you could turn on, like, a light switch, you know? Yeah. Where it's, like, you know, mm, well, you know, and then I have to sort of feed off it, like, oh, that's just asinine. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> but I can't say much more. It's, like, that, that, that's just disgraceful. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> Um, the idea, yeah, the idea, yeah. So I'm still cooking it. I'm still. How cooking. do you? Yeah, what are your best impressions? I mean, that's kind of up to the audience, but uh, you know, I mean, there's Jordan Peterson. There's uh, that one's really good. The Jordan Peterson one. I do Trump, Bernie. Um, oh, let's hear the Bernie. Oh, look, look, Brigitte, we're talking right now because I'm a Jew and I have the Brooklyn thing down. I think it's Brooklyn. We are having this conversation, not just for the 99, not just for the 1%, but for the 99% of working people of this country. Is that such a radical idea? Oh, I want to talk about Sweden and Denmark. Um, so yeah, there's a, I forget who else is in, you know, there's, there's a bunch in my roster. Um, there's the Trump, you know, which took a little bit to figure out because there's so many different angles on him. How do you, you, how do you go about working, uh, an impression? Yeah. What's interesting is like, um, impressions are very visual more than just the way they sound, you know, like before you do an impression, I think it, I, I kind of figure it out like a puzzle piece. A lot of impressions will say like, Oh, you, you see a line that they say Jordan Peterson, like, and all of a sudden the puzzle piece clicks. You're like, that's what the, it is, you know? So before I even do a Jordan Peterson, it's like, mm. Mm. <laughs> like you, I think what goes on mentally is like, imagine you're looking at a mirror, but instead of seeing you, you see them. So mm -hmm. what do you see? So it's like, oh, Jordan would be like, you know, like, mm, ha, well, you know, it's like, yes. Stand up straight <laughs> with your shoulders back, you know? And then as the impression becomes more integrated, you know, into your inner self between the lines of order and chaos, you factor in the tonality, the melody, the arc in which the way they speak. I can even dissect that more. So it's like, uh, I mean, we've done a lot of Jordan here. I could keep going on that one. Trump is more like, uh, you know, it's like lips and face. <laughs> then you get the tone and you get the way he speaks and it's kind of like this. And then you add a little grasp and then all of a sudden it kind of happens all at once. But like, <laughs> not going to let that happen. Not going to let that happen. Cook that one in. And then, you know, you can get more of the dynamics down. You can really, that's what they're doing. It's terrible. It's terrible. Um, but yeah, so there's like a, a Jordan Peterson, a way in which they speak. Then there's the Albert mm. accent, you know, there's like the that and, you know, the way they kind of talk in Canada and it kind of everything is like that. And then all of a sudden, you know, you get the face down and then before you know it, it's like, well, okay. There's sort of the initial so. cracking, the, cracking the code. And then if you're like, oh, but something's not working there. Um, and then you kind of have to figure out what that is. But I don't like, it's not quite like a, an, learning an instrument where you're sitting down trying to figure out the painstaking every, it's almost like, 
fitting the puzzle in and then like fine tuning like a, the, like a rubrics cube <laughs> yeah and then once you crack it like you once once you're on the other side of it you're like okay here's the person that i'm in it like i'm in it i've turned it on i've turned on jordan peterson i've turned on trump or or bernie's like look look throw it in look there i am right there bernie okay Ilhan Omar, at least he's, something happened to some people some time ago on 9-11. But, you know, so, you know, there. Um, <laughs> so it all kind of happens I'm, at once. Yeah, It is like magic to me and people who are really good at impressions because I am comically bad at accents, but it's mm-hmm. funny. Like, I'm so mm-hmm. bad at it that it's funny. So it, like it's Nancy okay. Impression. It works. Right. Um, but... I, and then like every once in a while, I'll do a really good impression of somebody, but it's like, well, who Obama do you, what do you do? <laughs> Who's an anti? It's an ob- no, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know. I did. I think it happens very organically on my show dumpster fire when I'm I- impersonating someone. But one time yeah. I did an Obama and they're so used to me being so bad at it. They were like, that was actually pretty good. That, that was, was good. a good, that was a good that Obama. Was good. That was what I you just, have to do. There's Chicago. You got to put that in there and we got a few things to do, you know? I don't have it perfect, but <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a fun one, I think, to kind of impersonate because he's so he's got this very. He's see always how like, even, yeah. Let me see it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I see. That's what I think I need to get more into is the face. Mm-hmm. Why well, do the like, Obama? Do the Obama? No pressure. No pressure. I'm just curious. What do you do? like? I I I think he always seems to talk about things and end in a high tone. You know, he's he's always very. <laughs> We've got to get this done. We've got hope. None of this is my fault. I I don't know why things are the way they are, but they're nothing to do with me, obviously. I was a perfect president, and I'm still the president today. <laughs> I like, it's an anti-impression because it's so like it, everybody knows what you're noticing when you do that, which is very funny because it's different than your typical impression, which is trying to get it perfect. It's more like yeah. that's what it is. <laughs> well, with Obama, you, you take a lot of time. And I think that if you're going to assemble a word salad, put it together, <laughs> you need to take some ideas from the left, the lettuce, some ideas from the right, the tomato, and some dressing to put it all together so that we could find a path forward. And for <laughs> folks, and, and listen, folks, like you can say a lot of things and not mean a thing. Um, and I find that with Obama, bless his heart. When he's putting together a lot of things that sound nice and fluffy and intellectual and digestible, um, I can keep going. But remember, I haven't said a thing. I'm just <laughs> talking. And if you look at the situation going on, there are there are folks, there are actors with good intentions, and there are folks <laughs> with bad intentions. And remember, we need to form coalitions and conversations <laughs> and castigrations and castrations of all these folks <laughs> to eventually come to a, an appreciation and an understanding uh, for a better future. That was good. You're getting there. It sounded, it sounded more country in the beginning, but I feel like you found your way into the Chicago. <laughs> well, Chicago and the country. I mean, I'm trying to unite the South, the North, the Midwest, because I'm a United. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But you yeah, see, I said a whole bunch of nothing. And so my critique of like a lot of that stuff is like, this is all nice. I, I didn't hear anything. There were no ideas there. There were just words. You know, yeah. I don't want to get into one of the things that's happened in the past month is like, look, there, there's a difference between our opponents and our enemies. And in one in one sense, there's been a part of me that's been like, like when, when Biden came out in that first week and like was nothing but sympathetic, it was nice to just see like, okay, we have enemies and we have opponents in the mm-hmm. peacetime world that we live in where we can, you know, we can crap on each other and say, you know, and I'm all for that in a certain respect, but in a time where we're, t- we're talking about the forces of light and the forces of darkness, um, we all should remember that in, in, in this is a civilizational battle we're in. So within the side of civilization, let's not call everybody we politically disagree with an enemy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at the same time, I'm also like, but sometimes those policies and those ideas embolden enemies. So you get a little worked up, but it's, a, it's hard. It's a hard place. It's, I'm not fully decided on how to approach it, you know? Yeah. I've been, I've been getting a lot of crap because I don't feel like my audience is big enough to have captured me yet or something, but Mm -hmm. they're, 
always like often I'm accused of being kind of a captain of the fence writing team. And now everyone's like, I thought you could see both. I was like, this seems I, I, I've i never said that I see both sides of everything. I just try to. This what seems have you very clear flack? to me. What have you gotten flack for? I've heard a good amount of people in my audience who are like, thank you for the for being, you know, clear about this. But then there's a kind of I, I don't know, there's like a kind kind of they're not anti-Semitic, they're edgelord. Like it's like a contrarian edgelord, you know, where mm-hmm. there's also this kind of like I don't I don't know, like tech kind of just naturally contrarian edge lording that happens where people don't they're like i'm just for peace i'm just for mm-hmm. peace i i think people are i think i i you know made some I mean? videos about this i think people are uncomfortable with being one sided about something and which is weird because they, everybody's been one sided like we we've but, we've, but, but we forget that being one sided doesn't mean being wrong when a rapist comes in and rapes a victim and we take the side of the victim you're you're being one sided and you're being right you know i think there's this idea of like neutrality feels balanced feels good and there's this sort of maybe it's a left of center temperament where when you're faced with evil and you're faced with aggression it's much easier to look away from it and externalize it as if it's some other force that has captured humanity there are no actors responsible for their behavior it's simply war that's the problem and we should we need peace and i i'm like yeah we do need peace do you know how you get to peace there are people who are standing fully in the way of peace who don't want peace so unfortunately in the world of human affairs you have to sometimes defend yourself against people who don't want peace to get peace yeah not i want peace here let's skip the step of trying to uh, combat the people who want to kill us all. Yeah, that's like <laughs> you know, I was uh, talking to my husband about this, the irony of having to fight for peace, but it is something you have to fight for. It's that that concept of uh, freedom isn't free. <laughs> better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Right? That's a Rogan line or something. You know? And I'm like, you know, peace happens. I, I wish it wasn't so. I wish everybody wanted to live and coexist peacefully and trade and be prosperous and tolerant. Great, but it's just there are unfortunately regimes in this world that don't want that, that don't share those values. And I think for some people, they they turn a blind eye to that or they're not really aware of to the extent that there are actors in this world who are committed to destruction, who are committed to the afterlife, not this life, you know, and they and they have genocidal means towards Jews and towards destruction of the West, the West and Western value. Yeah. So like, you know, and then so when you see a situation and you see somebody take a stand and take a side, you automatically, there's this instinct to become suspicious. Well, then you must be biased. Right. You must be clouded. Your judgment must be, uh, you know, somewhat unbalanced or uh, affected in some way. You must be captured as opposed to, but the truth is it's really the people who fail to see the moral clarity that are captured and confused and blinded. They're blinded by pacifism. They're blinded by, new, you know, a, a sense of moral equivalence. Mm-hmm. You know, they're blinded by these other ideas. And it sounds great. Like we we don't want war. Like who wants no war? one wants, wants war. War, war, war. We want to, def- you know. But there's a very big difference between, uh, you know, aggression and self defense. And if your choice is between self defense and suicide, which is what pacifism is, people come at you and you're like, we cannot fight. We have to. We cannot do that. You're you're essentially advocating for people to just roll over and and be destroyed. Well, I guess the and, argument yeah, would be yeah. that like Raytheon and, you know, all these companies want war and they back the politicians. Mm-hmm. And this is where I have a lot of sympathy with the kind of mm-hmm. populist po- generation that grew up post 9-11 who was told a lot yes. of bullshit to get into. We we came of yes, age around it, then. So the scars of bad military decisions by the United States historically in the aftermath of 9-11. That's a whole academic discussion, which is totally fair to have. And it's very understandable why people have a uh, have an aversion towards just jumping into foreign entanglements mm-hmm. because of past mistakes of going after the wrong people, designating people as enemies who were not responsible for 9-11. Weapons of mass destruction. And, and going in under the wrong standards. Like instead of going into liberate Iraq, it's sh- the idea and, and should have been American self-defense. And I don't think that was the standard by which America was operating from a self-defense standpoint, even though maybe they, they use that as lip service as opposed to trying to, you know, sort of this um, view of 
spreading democracy by force across the world. It's like, is that what's necessary or is American self-defense necessary? Right. Which I would argue now is having an alliance with Israel, fighting a common enemy that seeks destruction is much more in line with America's interest than American self-defense. That is a appropriate academic discussion to have. And I get why people are, why people are, uh, you know, averse and instinctually don't want to like see that. And they see, Oh, Ukraine, they see Iraq. They're like, they see it all over again. So it's bringing up like that trauma. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of what and you see before. the, co- you hear the, you know, the like company mm-hmm. business calls coming out and like, we're going to, you yeah. see the stocks going up and it, it's definitely, yeah. I can totally empathize and understand. And I have to fight it in myself. With the hesitancy. Yeah, with the hesitancy, of course. Yeah. And just like, ah, oh, shit. Like I, I read, I'm not, yeah, I read a long time ago. I forgot what book it was about. Like one of the reasons the United States took so long to get into world war two was because there was a culture of pacifism after world war one mm. that everybody did not realize the destruction and the horror of war in an industrialized world post-industrialized world of World War One, industrialized warfare, people were, you know, came back having missed, miss and there was a draft, and, you know, so people came back with missing limbs and so many dead people so that when World War II came around, which was a much more different kind of threat that was much more of a threat to America and uh, and the allies that were fighting America, it was, a, it was very hard politically to get people to support getting involved because of the scars and trauma of World War One, mm. and World War One is always this interesting, confused topic of why America was involved. How did it happen? I think it's an interesting um, historical thing to explore because that I I don't know the details of it as well as scholars would, but there was a confusion as to why we were involved. There was a lot of confusion as to what was going on, and I think the trauma of that like left a sort of a lingering culture of pacifism in the uh, population in the United States that did not want to get involved in any wars. There was an isolationism that existed then. Uh, and I read all this, these aren't my ideas, but I was like, that's interesting. Cause you're seeing that sort of now sort of this instinct towards isolationism, non or, or, or more specifically non-interventionism as opposed to evaluating, you know, it's possible that all those wars that we were entangled with or for the wrong reasons. And it could be that getting involved at this point or supporting our allies, fighting a common enemy would be the right reason. But I can understand the, that aversions to that or hesitancy to that. It doesn't come from a bad place. Yeah. You know? I mean, we'd been, when we left the Afghanistan in the horrific way we did mm-hmm. it, I think my nephew was it, it like, he'd only known us being, at war, he's like we've been at war my whole entire life, but not like mm-hmm. at it's it's weird a weird detached at war. You have a lot of soldiers coming back and being mm-hmm. homeless and killing themselves, and the you know I yeah. I it's it's very it never really ended. You know that mm-hmm. that the like post nine eleven thing just kind of dragged on, and then and fair enough, yeah. it's a worth it academic discussion. And, not, and it's, it's it's worthwhile discussion to constantly be vigilant about making sure that, you know, these conversations about to what extent America should be involved in, from a foreign policy standpoint, in making sure there's a security apparatus from the standard of American self-defense, not from the standard of trying to be the just policeman of the world for everybody in every country. Mm-hmm. It's fair enough to ask other countries to defend themselves mm-hmm. and put in resources to make sure they have proper defense. And make sure the standard remains American self-defense for American citizens. The responsibility of a government is to its own citizens. Fair enough. Um, and I can see why then that compromises cases where American American allyship and involvement is justified. So I, like I said, like it's understandable. And we should be vigilant about it and not just make impulsive decisions and just get involved. And, you know, I think I think people have lost in America in a sense there's been a lost sense of what the standard should be for American involvement, yes. American self-defense. And I think you'd get a lot more people on board when that was articulated properly from a moral standpoint. Like America's getting involved because of our strategic interests and uh, self-defense uh, standard. That's why we are doing this. There's an, a common enemy here. And in, with, when it comes to Israel, I'm not saying anything policy-wise because I'm not a you know politician or a military tactician on how America should do it or or support Israel per se. But being that Israel is the canary in the coal mine in this ideological war. It's not a regional geopolitical dispute from my perspective. There's an ideological war happening. And when two friends have a common enemy um, in a region of the world where you really have, you know, no friends, Israel being the the most (laughs) aligned with American values, 
hopefully building alliances with other countries, you know, when it comes to like Abrahamic Accords and all those things, trying to build those alliances, strategic alliances is super important for American security, not to do a favor to people who may not. And then I can see why citizens in this country would say like, I don't have a connection. So why would my tax dollars go there? Yeah. It's like, no, no, no. We're operating from a, don't forget that standard and don't lose sight. Like we're operating from a position of American self-defense. Um, but again, past mistakes can cloud the judgment and understanding of that a hundred percent. You know? Yeah, definitely. Well, mm. this has been, so where do we go from here? Well, I we asked the two questions I ask at the end of all of my mm. podcasts. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> what is your biggest defect of character? Oh, my biggest defect. Interesting. Believe it or not, like I, I'm not, I don't know if it's a defect, but um, um, I've gotten better at it, but I think wanting, you know, wanting to appease everyone or wanting to be agreeable, not be confrontational to a point where, um, which you would be surprised given some of the recent stuff I've been putting out because, <laughs> you know, but it's like, you know, even, and not to keep circling back to Jordan Peterson, he says, I don't like confrontation. I don't like negativity and negative interactions. And I, I don't, I don't like that. Um, but sometimes um, in the, in the attempt to be agreeable with people, you end up being dishonest, yeah. you know, by telling people like, Oh yeah, that's cool. No problem. Like maybe there's better ways to be candid to the point where you don't disrespect somebody by being dishonest with them. Mm. I try to be honest. Um, but sometimes it's hard to tell hard truths to people. And I found myself sometimes, I don't know, as far as character wise, like, like maybe just trying to make somebody feel okay with something or not want to, not want to confront something that's uncomfortable, but in the end it's, uh, it's better to be honest, even if it's slightly uncomfortable mm -hmm. and it's more respectful to do that for people. I'm kind of being general about it. I don't even know if that's the right answer, but you're putting me on the spot. So otherwise, um, I mean, it sounds like I people can, you know, pleasing. Like, People pleasing a little bit. I, I I also can get a little micro focused on things where like uh you know balance like you know as a creative you kind of get like into things yeah. and then you can burn your you can burn yourself out a little bit in the world of content creation and stuff like that. Um, stretching myself a little thin. Yeah. Not balancing and scheduling. Like I'm not naturally the most. I'm not a mess disorganized wise, but I've had to work really hard at being disciplined. Get like you know so that I can you know, schedule my day and my time enough so that it's efficient and that doesn't have diminishing returns. Yeah. You know, there's always this hard debate in my internal self between like, it's all hard work. It's all hard work. It's all hard work. You got to, you know, in trying to build, um, you know, uh, sort of, you know, a space for my, what I do. Um, so you're constantly conflicted between it's all hard work versus, well, you're also burning yourself out a bit and you're going to burn the candle at both ends and then you'll diminish everything. So like taking breaks and integrating that kind of balance. Cause when you come from having, you know, from obscurity in a space where like in the world of entertainment, like you'll do anything and everything at first to just build up a foundation. But then it, co it comes to a point where you have to make sure you're, you're putting up the proper parameters and guardrails to live a balanced life and not become consumed by your own uh, creations. Yes. Does that make sense? No, totally. I mean, I okay. live, I live in that same space yeah. where it's constantly like, I should be working harder, but I, I also, yeah, we do this. I have this constant joke about like feeding the mm -hmm. algorithm and how it's become like this troll under bridge mm -hmm. that I need to pay <laughs> toll to. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. we must feed the algorithm and it's just feed like, just constantly feed beating me down. Um, yeah. I used to joke, like I, I, I do have a lot more respect for when I used to do like workout videos and stuff, the content mm -hmm. creators would always end up having the women in particular would have like a nervous breakdown at some point. And they'd be like, <laughs> I just, I just feel like so much pressure to put this content out and I'm not feeling mm -hmm. good and I've gained weight and I'm just not. <laughs> and like, you're like, come on, this is like the easiest shit in the world. You're making content. This isn't a real job. And now I'm like, Oh my God, I was joking with my husband. I'm like, I'm going to go get a job at Chili's. At least I can like There's leave my work at, at at Chili's. Do you know who Alex Hermosi is? The content creator Alex Hermosi. Like he has this line about like um, he's like a business entrepreneur and he does fitness stuff too. But there's a, there's something I live by a little bit, which which resonated with me, which was do what's required. Right. Like whatever it is, it's uncomfortable. Do what's required. Do what is required. And I always think in the world of content creation and having your own audience, which is an amazing time to be an artist and creator. So amazing. It's almost like I never want the excuse to be something that was in my control. 
Like I'll do everything I can that's in my control right. and I don't blame anything else. Oh, I didn't get this opportunity or this audition or this, this. I'm like, look, as long as I'm doing everything I can do in my control. Um, and to quote Kumel Nanciani, it's like, oh, listen, I want to do this, but I don't want to break my back doing this. You know? like, <laughs> you know, like that, I thought that was really interesting. It's like, yeah, you don't, you don't want to sacrifice yourself for your own success. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and I also thought of one more character defect that I'm now blanking on, but um, um, I'm trying to get it back. There was another one where, oh, when it comes to like political conversations and stuff, I've worked hard over the years at not confusing being persuaded by intellectual ideas with being the intellectual myself, you know, just because there's something that resonates with me that I fully understand that should not close me off to being open to what people are saying. And I find that oftentimes political conversations and debates that are not constructive, that end poorly, it's because people are kind of waiting their turn to get their talking point out that resonates with them. And they haven't really listened to a word the other person has said and considered it. It's more like, and I understand where it comes from. For me, it would always come from, well, listen, I just read this incredible book that is so obviously true to me. It's such a compelling case. And I really want you to see it. I want to share that truth with you. This is so amazing. Uh, whether it's uh, whatever, whatever, whatever it may be, set of ideas have, have resonated with you that have sort of changed the way you think about something. You know, bring that to the table, but don't close yourself off to somebody else because, you know, and, and maybe the person who wrote that book can defend it and and bring all the stats and studies and information that that draw them to that conclusion. But just because I've agreed with it, like leave the conversation open to learning something on both ends as opposed to what I used to do, which I'd find myself in conversations and I'd say, okay, like like you, we said earlier about the tribe or the this, you'd want to wait to say like your point based on ideas that resonate with you. Yeah. And you really haven't listened to the other person. And then you end up just kind of nodding, okay, okay. And it's like, they haven't understood you. You really haven't understood them because you've been convinced appropriately that what they're saying is nonsense, but you're not really listening to them or the, or the good faith motivations behind what they might be saying. Yeah. And I have found that more lately in podcasting and talking to people, I've always had you know, my friends, uh, in peer groups, people disagree and stuff. But when we would get into politics, it's not like it would get uncomfortable or ugly, but it wouldn't get anywhere because I'm not really, I would catch myself not really listening. It's more like wait, waiting the opportunity to say what I want to say about something. Yeah. So I'd say that's more of an accurate defect for me that I've noticed. I've tried to change, check the confirmation bias, the right and the left, try to listen to what someone's saying and really understand not just what they're saying or the point they're making, but what might be motivating that? Like, what are they, what are they really trying to get to from a good faith perspective? Mm -hmm. Not, not from bad intentions, but from good intentions. Well, you know? um, I meant to ask you too, before I ask the f other question, what, um, mm -hmm. you went to the March for Israel? Israel? Yes. How was it? Yeah. It was great. It was beautiful. Um, you know, I, uh, I think that the last one I went to was like in 2002, I was like 15 years old. And, uh, and it was during like second intifada against Israel after waves of violent attacks and suicide bombings against Israelis in restaurants and on buses. And so we went in solidarity then. Um, and, and, you know, at the time I was 15. So like, I was also distracted. Um, yeah. but, uh, but this time it was beautiful and it was a mix of things. Like it was, a, it was also, it was a really nice program, you know, some great Israeli artists performed and it was like a Passover program. It was quite nice. But, um, the, uh, the, <laughs> the, the show of solidarity is obviously meaningful. I have found that in the past like month, it's been hard to say anything insincere. You know, usually sometimes you say something like from the heart and it sometimes always feels like couched in a little bit of like cheesiness or like that whole cringe, like it's hard to be sincere sometimes, especially when you're cynical or right. comedic, right? But these times just feel like we heard from parents of host of, of, of kids who were taken hostage uh. who were spoke. Deborah Lipstadt spoke um, amazing. There were politicians who spoke and, and uh, it was beautiful to just be there in solidarity with everybody. And I think also one thing to notice is like no property was destroyed. There were chants for the USA, USA. There was shows of of solidarity with Israel and shows of solidarity with the U S uh, with, there was patriotism. There was uh, there was a sense of taking a moral stance um, and showing solidarity, not just with Israel, but with the values that Israel stands for, you know, people can't, yeah, there was no damage done to property. There were no ripping down of American flags. Yeah. There were Israeli and American flags being held. And I think it's important to take note of that yeah. when you're judging the differences in the quality moral quality of these protests of where what is motivating these protests and what sentiments are motivating the protests. 
I can understand people being sympathetic and feeling for suffering. Yeah. But I was proud of the fact that we're here and we are celebrating um, not just Israel, but the United States and the shared alliance and shared solidarity of the two countries. Yeah. It looked amazing. And the communities that are connected, you know? Yep. It do, it did um, so. seem very you know very just a totally different vibe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's face was uncovered. Yeah, everyone was proud to be there unapologetically. No one is uh, shying away, and no one's kicking down doors, and no one's putting you know no one's ripping down flags. So Nothing to be afraid. Coordinated of. It's like, those protests yeah. that are like that with oh. the face mat. I don't know. It's very strange. It's very strange I mean, to yeah, me. Yeah, you see, you see a vibe that's frightening. Yeah, um, you know, you see a vibe that's frightening. Yeah, um, I've been in some of those and, protests, uh, and and yeah, it's not chill. No, no, <laughs> no. Uh, way um, back in like Black Lives Matter early days, I think like mm -hmm. post Ferguson, I went to one downtown LA, and then it was like it got gnarly at night. And then, you know, like mm -hmm. part of the group segued off to go to the free. I was like, I'm going home. This is nuts. <laughs> um, and I was taking yeah. pictures yeah. and it just, it felt not, you know, it felt very, it was weird too. It, like, I remember this guy came through. It just like collects anyone who wants to protest anything. This guy came through and he had a, he had a cardboard sign and he was like, I'm here for the, you know, like I'm protesting the forest being torn. I was like. So is this just like everyone with a grievance is just climate come justice yeah, intersection? It was like, it was like intersectionality, everything. It was just climate you know, justice, but he was mad at everyone else for protesting with Black Lives Matter. It's like I I feel like uh -huh. I'm like you're downtown LA. There's like two trees. I feel like you're not at the right protest. Yeah, and I think it highlights the distinctions we talked. I talked about with you earlier about you know the the types of temperaments of being bitter, resentful, hateful versus being grateful, humble, and appreciative. And, you know, I don't know, trying to pick up on uh, which groups are aligning more with which side on that. Um, it, mm. It's pretty apparent, you know? Yeah. We weren't surrounded What's a bunch your... of police cars going, ga, 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 bleh, bleh, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that did not happen. What's your biggest asset other than your amazing Jordan B. Peterson <laughs> impression? I think... Being able to maintain a certain sense of, uh, I think comedy is very disarming and uniting kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, being able to laugh with people and like, uh, honestly, aside from no matter what, where people are politically, uh, unless you want like me to just die, unless you're like against my existence or you're violent in, in a place where we can have political disagreements or whatever, all I care about is if you can chill and laugh. Like I have friends who are very left of center I have friends who are right of center. You know, we all have crazy uncles with crazy views. Yeah. But if we can all chill and laugh. It's always a crazy people can uncle. Say all sorts, people can say crazy things, but like the, be, the ability to like sit and hang and chill and laugh, like, you know, I guess I pride myself on being able to talk to people of different stripes. And if I could still make them laugh at the end of it, like with Candace Owens and our conversation, we ended on a laugh. Yeah. Like, that is a special thing that I don't take for granted. And I hope to be able to continue to do that because at the end of the day, comedy, uh, the gift of comedy can permeate all of those misunderstandings to say, you know what, you know, uh, Ben Shapiro talks a lot about facts don't care about your feelings. But the what I would say to that is, yes, but f feelings care about your facts, you know, and the way people digest information and respond to each other is emotional right. and human to human. So even if all your data is correct, I'm going to reject it if... I feel uncomfortable or threatened or that the, that the vibe here is not pleasant or, mm -hmm. you know, and I think having more of that ability to socially lubricate the situation where people can feel comfortable and that everyone has good intentions, even if we disagree and we can all laugh at the same jokes, like that is maybe something that I'm good at. Um, and, and I think that overall, like the ability to laugh at something together to me, that's, that's where I draw the line, you know, cancel culture, all that kind of stuff. That's why to me, I was so like, if somebody's joking about something, you know, they're joking about something mm -hmm. and they're, it's an admirable, noble attempt. Mm -hmm. They're trying to make you enjoy your day for a minute. They, you may not like it. It may not be for you, but all of us being able to laugh and joke around, say crazy things from a comedic angle 
and from a comedic motivation, it's like, that's all very noble and m very important. I don't think I would have had a conversation with Candace Owens if she didn't like my impressions of Prince Harry. Right. You know, that's helpful. Unconscious bias. Like she liked that. And I think that's why like me talking, uh, me, me tweeting at her, like struck a nerve, be, you know, it's not because she found what I said, you know, to be something she disagreed with. There's plenty of people coming at her with stuff to, that she disagrees with, but maybe it was like, you know what, let's have a conversation because, you know, I like your funny stuff. So it, it allows this window into real dialogue and hopefully more constructive dialogue between people who could disagree, but can still hang. Yeah. You know, the hang's important. Yeah. Where can we find mm -hmm. you? Uh, all social media will be at AJ dash comedy, uh, Ami Kozak official, same thing, you know, username and handle AJ dash comedy, uh, Ami Kozak. Uh, my podcast just launched a few days ago called Ami's house, uh, at Ami's house pod on Instagram and Ami's house on YouTube. And, uh, yeah, I can listen to more music I make with my band called distant cousins and hope to hang with everybody soon. Yeah. Let me know if you yeah. come through Austin. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for Thank having me. Thank you for being Great here. Hold on to your jingle bells. Pluto TV has all your holiday favorites for free. Enjoy our season's greetings category with nine holiday channels, including holiday movie favorites by Lifetime, Festive Fireplace, Holiday Lights, and Hallmark Movies and more. Download the Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming holiday favorites on live channels and on demand with thousands of free movies and TV shows. Pluto TV is your home for the holidays. Pluto TV. Stream now. Pay never. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie's laughing at me because I printed out <laughs> a picture. There, there's just something about every time you appear on a podcast as a woman and it's a male podcast, which is 98% Most of, them. Percent yeah. of the time. The freaking picture they choose of you. I mean, usually it's not lit well anyways. Yeah. But the, the setup's usually awkward. Yeah, there's no, you don't need to care if you're a dude. No. And I mean, I remember when you went to go record it, you had, you had to text them and be like, what's the setup? We're because talking about were, trigger pod. You were trying to figure out w what you could wear. And they were like, oh, it's going to like, so you're like, so I can't wear a skirt for that shot. You know, like, yeah. otherwise you were going to wear a dress, but yeah. you were like, I can't like the, the shot would have been like up your skirt basically. <laughs> yeah. Thank <laughs> so goodness. Then, I asked. Yeah. Yes. Things men don't have to think about. And so it was, it's just funny because they don't seem to have the, and so I got this, you know, they asked me to be a collaborator on the Instagram post, kind of boosting it. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> I, 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 the picture is not flattering. No, it and looks like I ate she, <laughs> eat she cake for breakfast every day of my life. And it's zoomed in so you can see every pore and wrinkle. And my neck looks like I have a gizzard or whatever, like a turkey. <laughs> it's so bad. I was, I almost cried. I'm I'm not that vain. No. If I was vain, I would I would be like getting all kinds of work and I would have weaned Matilda immediately so I could start getting Botox again and I would have, you know, I'm I'm still putting my child's well-being <laughs> before my vanity, although I don't know after this picture how long that's going to hold up. It's brutal. A, because I look like I'm eating my face and you don't look like that in real life. I mean, Jesus, I have I printed out a picture of it as motivation. <laughs> and then B, this is our like post Thanksgiving fat shaming check in and lighting and, and lighting and camera angle and zoom like men are oblivious. Apparently oblivious. <laughs> Remember when we were setting up dumpster fire and it was a dude yeah. And I was like, I don't know. And he was not... like, you want to shoot from below because that's the power shot. And I was like, I don't know about that. It doesn't feel like it was flattering. And then we luckily Whitney Cummings was here and she's like uh, even, you know, she's been in the public eye for a long, long time and has been on camera and doing this. And she was like, no, no, light here, add light, do you need this, to go, do that. Uh, you go need a taller up. shot. Yeah. She was like, man, I'm like, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank God we had a woman here. Uh -huh. She's. I was like, do I look like, is this? She's like, no. I'm like, thank you. 
I know we still want to redo that set too. And like, she was like, you need to be nice if you had, like she has, she had great ideas for what we could do. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, that'd be great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Yep. I'm at the texting my friends, what lasers they use <laughs> phase of my life. <laughs> which I can't even afford. I'm like, I need to make that laser money. Bridget was like, I need to fly to South Korea and go. (laughs) She's like, I need to make money to do like to fly to South Korea to get some procedure done. I don't even know what some laser work done. (laughs) I was like, you can't get that done here. You have to go to South Korea for that. Cheaper. (laughs) It would be cheaper for me to fly to South Korea and get it done. Wow. Allegedly. I don't know. All the things. It seems like, and everyone's like, oh, you can just age gracefully. I'm like, you are, I can understand why actresses like become anorexic and lose their minds. Yeah. And go crazy <laughs> yeah. and get too much work done and whatnot. Yeah. Cause, cause you lose it. You, it is, it is not easy to age in general, but aging on camera in public is horrific. As a woman. <laughs> is horrific. And I'm not even saying like, because of commenters, it is all me. Yeah. It's all like, Jaron was like, you look beautiful, my like, honey. He's like, okay, you don't, that doesn't look like you. That's not a flattering picture. I'm like, thank you. I, I, It doesn't make me feel better when you lie and say I look great in that picture. Well, but then- like I get it too, because I I everyone does it the same where you look at a picture of yourself and all you see are your flaws. Yeah, and and everyone else is like, you look beautiful, and you're like, no, look at this and look at this and there, look at this. Everybody's also full of shit and being nice. No, I only trust are, like two people to be act real with me there about are this some, stuff. But there are some people like there are some pictures of you that are like i'm like you look amazing and you're like oh this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong right there was that time the other night where we were trying to pick a thumbnail for dumpster fire and i was sending you options and you were like just picking everything apart there and- is something wrong with my teeth though i see it in this picture as well and i don't know what's going on with them but i <laughs> but literally you could I- all, all I got back was just like this and this and this. And I was like, finally, I was like, I'm not sending you any more pictures of yourself tonight. I would like anyone listening to try and put themselves in the shoes of having their face out there 24 seven, no matter when, how they feel. I know. Or, it, or like, I get any it. Of it. I get why, I get why people go crazy with this stuff and why everyone looks like a Kardashian now. Yeah. Because there's a reason I don't do it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Yeah. Well, I don't think I can do it either. (laughs) (laughs) So we need to rethink our business plan. Is that what you're saying? We just find like some young Addy and tell her her name is Bridget Fetissey. We're like, you're you're me now. (laughs) I W Bridget Fetissey. You're you're all your lines. I will be sitting on a beach, (laughs) not earning anything. (laughs) I'm going to go homestead now. (laughs) <laughs> go at least even the homesteaders are hot uh, what kind of homesteader is hot only the ones you see on on camera it's ruin instagram has ruined the world for real you know the ones out in the backwoods who aren't posting their shit on camera look i mean i'm not young anymore this is the thing people always say this when you have a daughter like women it's kind of this passive aggressive weird bitchy thing that older women say to women who have girls they're like oh be careful the girls will steal your look yeah that's and such a bullshit thing it's a to weird say. thing to say don't say it to someone i don't understand why you would feel compelled to say that it's it's such a weird weird thing it's it says more about them than anything but i heard it multiple times and i was like good i'm done with my looks but now i'm like that little monster <laughs> took my looks I have drastically uglified since the child. <laughs> Being a parent ages you. Yeah, it does. You know, it's lack of sleep more yeah, than anything. That's true. You know, like it's true of <laughs> Jaren the other day woke up and he was like, I, I was like, how'd you sleep? He's like, I don't know. I just never wake. I just never feel well rested when I wake up. I'm like, that's, I think, the perpetual state of parenthood. And yeah. it's like, I imagine exponential with every child. Yeah. Because you do, you just see parents and they're just like, ah, I'm so tired. <laughs> <laughs> I see it even when I try and shoot dumpster fire and just the circles under my eyes. Yeah, it's it's tough. It's tough. 
aging is tough. And I'm grateful to age. And it's not for sissies at all. But man, it's really hard. It's sometimes I, I hate having to add a dumpster fire because I just don't want to look at my ugly face. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I hate seeing myself on camera too. Like I understand that and I'm not the one who has to, you know, perform. So that's- And I'm not, I haven't been one of those women that's, I think if you grow up in LA or you, you come of age in LA or you are famous from a young age and you make money, you have the money to like invest in, in always looking perpetually. I mean, Your I think upkeep. work makes you look 40 no matter what, but you always look, yeah, you look, I was watching some clip the other night on Instagram for, of Tina Fey and I was like, it is that meme. You're not ugly. You're just poor. Right. She was, she was like an overweight writer and then she had no wrinkle. I'm like, how did you get actually hotter every year that you got older? Because you're rich. Money. Yeah. Money. Yeah. You, you can spend money on quaffing yourself and pampering yourself and de-aging yourself and you're taking care of your skin and having someone take care of your skin and this your hair. This is how and everyone your... will suddenly know if I ever make money. <laughs> when Bridget gets hotter. <laughs> it might be too late, though. It'll be too it's late. never too late. It'll be too late to reverse the effects. Never too late. It reminds me of that doctor who was yet so mad at me that I had never had Botox when I was like 30. And he was like, age. You're going to, you can't. He's like, we, gonna catch we're never going to be able to keep you in your 20s, but we might be able to keep you in your 30s if you start now. Wow. That's such a sad thing to say to someone. He was a dermatologist. And he was like, you know, you. He was like, legitimately mad that I looked as good as I did without work. Without work, and he was like, "Well, you can thank your genes because it has nothing to do with anything else you're doing." I know you don't even wear suntan lotion. <laughs> I I've started wearing suntan lotion <laughs> in your forties. That doesn't do shit. No, I. Well, yeah. I mean, again, too late for the damage there. It's going to be lasers in South Korea. It's like my hands driving in L.A. really ages your hands. Yeah. I mean, apparently my neck needs some work too. <laughs> <laughs> I know people get Botox there on the regular. Yeah. Get rid of the cleavage wrinkle. That was like when the, the Botox lady told me that I had a peau de l'orange it's like orange chin or something because of the way that i talk oh and so now apparently i need botox in my chin (laughs) (laughs) she was like see how it gets it all just being a tongue thruster it all comes back to being a tongue it does actually it comes back (laughs) to your teeth my (laughs) face would be so much hotter if i hadn't been a tongue thruster i've really gone down some messed up rabbit holes on this (laughs) Like, it really affected the whole entire bone structure of my face. That's so weird. That's so weird. And I don't want to give my daughter a complex, but I don't, I, don't want, I don't want her to have to suffer the aging tongue thruster disease. You just have to make sure she's swallowing correctly. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that can be trained out of you at a young age. I mean, how do they even know? Your dentist knew. <sighs> My dentist didn't tell me until I was in my 40s. No, because you went to a dentist who finally told you. You went to a new dentist. But now it's too late because I don't even have braces money. (laughs) (laughs) Need to get that Invisalign money. I'm going to need that. I need Invisalign. This is all just so... (laughs) Vanity is expensive. Maybe I'll just say F it and I'll just go natural. And then everybody can tell me that I'm an aging buck tooth. I'll go with a wrinkled chin and <laughs> pot de l'orange or whatever the hell it's called. <laughs> like every time you get any work, you find out the more work you need. Yeah, because that's their job <laughs> is to sell you on the more work you need. Yes, but I do have an orange chin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Phetasy. I'm Bridget Phetasy, and you're welcome. (laughs) 
the dumbest line. <laughs>